The final topic for this chapter is break-even analysis. We won't spend too much time on it because I assume you have seen it in multiple times in other classes. All we are trying to do is find the point in both units and dollars when we begin to make money profit. To calculate the break-even point, we need estimates for both fixed cost and variable cost and also the revenue. Again, I am asso assuming you know the difference between the fixed cost and variable cost and will not belabor the point. Just like any analysis we do, we should be cognizant of the assumptions we are using to make the analysis. There are several assumptions that we are making with break-even analysis. First, we are assuming that the cost and revenue are linear functions. In reality, this may not be true, but maybe it is a good approximation. If not, then you would have to do something else. We are also assuming that we actually know these costs. Sometimes this is easy, sometimes not so much. And finally, we are assuming there is no time value of money. Please don't tell your finance professor. The fixed cost is what is there no matter the volume of products we produce. The variable cost, then, is the slope of the line for the total cost curve. The total revenue line starts at zero and goes up at a variable rate. We hope the total revenue line is steeper than the total cost line. Why? Otherwise, we would never make money. We see where the two lines intersect is the break-even point. To the right of that point, we will be in the profit corridor, and to the left, we will be in the loss corridor. The break-even point occurs where the total cost line intersects with the total revenue line. That is, where they are equal to each other. So to find the break-even point, we set the two lines equal to each other and use algebra to solve for x, which in this case we have renamed BEP sub x, which stands for break-even point x as in units. We can also find the break-even point in dollars. Sometimes we are interested in the expected profit for different sales volumes, so we see the formula for profit here too. So let's look at an example. In this example, we have fixed cost of $10,000. Our variable costs are comprised of two elements, labor and material. The selling price is four bucks per unit. Using this example, we can find the break-even point in both dollars and units. For dollars, we see the substitutions here. The result is the break-even point in dollars is approximately $22,857.14. While this is useful, I find the break-even point in units more helpful. Here we find it to be approximately 5714 That is, we have to produce and sell 5714 units before we turn a profit. Here we see the graphical representation of the break-even point in both dollars and units. So again, the fixed cost at 10,000, total cost curve, total revenue, break-even point where they intersect. The last example only considers a single product. In the case of selling multiple products, we have the following formula for calculating the break-even point in dollars. Note that the letter I represents an index for the different products sold. This example is from the book. I suggest carefully reading through the example where you're selling sandwiches, drinks, and baked potatoes for different prices and different costs and annual forecasted sales. And also setting up a spreadsheet to keep track of your calculations. We see a few of the ending metrics. All right, so we see some calculations here that you should be doing in a spreadsheet. And then we see a few of the ending metrics here. That's the break even point in dollars and then the daily sales in dollars, and then how many sandwiches per day we'd have to sell. That's assuming that our mix of products of sales remains the same in the future. Finally, it's worth, note, worth noting that there are four commonly used strategies to expanding capacity. First, up in the upper left-hand corner, we have leading demand with incremental expansion. Here we are building in small steps in the hope that demand will follow. 
Next, we have leading demand with one-step expansion. A good example of this is building a new wing of a hospital to house the operating room suites and recovery rooms. You cannot easily just add one operating room. You need to do it in a much larger expansion, so a whole wing would be a good idea. We can also lag demand with incremental capacity expansion. This is when you wait until customers are complaining and then you add little by little to the capacity. And the final option is to try to average capacity with incremental expansion. While this seems like a good idea, being able to execute it operationally is quite difficult. Well, that finishes up Supplement 7, Capacity Planning.